Bifidobacter reseae, these were all listed at that highest critical priority level. I want to start out talking about ESBLs or extended spectrum beta lactamase producers. Um, these often are forgotten or underestimated how important these are in the resistance landscape. This is um, often they're forgotten about because we do have effective treatment for these agents. The carbipenems are extremely effective. They're the agents of choice for uh, uh, treating ESBL producing pathogens. And as a brief refresher, ESBLs are plasmid mediated uh, beta lactamases that are most commonly produced in Klebsiella pneumoniae and E. coli, but also in a variety of other gram negative pathogens. They're very efficient at hydrolyzing broad spectrum beta lactams with the exception of the carbipenems. Carbipenems, by and large, are, are, uh, can withstand the hydrolytic attempts by ESBLs. ESBLs often mediate resistance to other antibiotic classes, such as aminoglycosides, fluoroquinolones, sulfonamides. So an ESBL producer often is not only beta lactam resistant, it's often multi-drug resistant. And we've seen a global epidemic of increase in ESBL production, and that's been primarily occurring in E. coli and driven by CTXM, what 10 years ago or 15 years ago was a largely unheard of beta lactamase that now is the single most common uh, ESBL produced in the world. And this is really looked at, if you look at your hospital antibiogram over the years, you might notice that ESBL production among E. coli has really skyrocketed. Bottom line is the more ESBLs we see, or the greater threat of ESBL infection that you face among your patients, the more we are pushed to use carbipenems empirically. And also, once we get, confirm that there's ESBLs present, to treat with, with definitive therapy. Here is uh, data that I'm going to show you. All this is ARSP data from 2018. So this is all sort of local quote unquote data. And I want to, if you focus on the blue squares there, um, cepapim um, uh, resistance among Klebsiella pneumoniae uh, falls uh, right around a 30%. And this is a nice surrogate for uh, ESBL production. All, these all might not be ESBL producers, but by and large, this is a pretty good marker. If you take a look at E. coli, if you look at that uh, E. coli here, um, uh, if you uh, want to can focus at ceftriaxone, um, the ceftriaxone uh, is shown here in sort of the purple diamonds. And as you can notice, if you go back to 2009, um, what you might notice is that E. coli, um, uh, the third generation cephalosporin resistance in E. coli was about 20%, and that has increased to about uh, 30% in 2018. And again, that's largely being driven by CTXM production. And now this CTXM is not only produced frequently in E. coli, but also has become predominantly, predominant ESBL produced in Klebsiella pneumonia as well. So as I said, the more ESBLs you have, the more carbipenems you use. And carbipenems are very effective at treating ESBL producers, but unfortunately, too much carbipenem use often leads to bad things. This is data um, from Ray Hall et al. from JAMA 1997, where in New York City, um, they were noticing an ESBL increase in their hospital. And they attributed this to third generation cephalosporin use, which was their go-to ceftriaxone, ceftazidine, were their agents they used for empiric nosocomial infection treatment. And they, uh, they decided that since they were probably uh, fostering this ESBL epidemic with third generation cephalosporin use, they made a conscious decision to switch in 1995, shown in red on the middle column, switch from empiric cephalosporin use to empiric carbipenem use. So carbipenems became, became their workhorse nosocomial antibiotic as opposed to cephalosporins. They had a huge drop in cephalosporin use and a huge uh, increase in carbipenem use. But, and their ESBL rates drop, but lo and behold, within one year, their imipenem resistant pseudomonas rates increased by about 70%. So in a single year, by increasing carbipenem use, they avoided ESBL exacerbation, but they ended up with an even worse uh, problem that was harder to treat with imipenem resistant pseudomonas. 
So as we push harder and harder and lean more and more on the carbapenems, we're more likely to see carbapenem resistant um, gram negatives. So I think that carbapenem resistance among gram negatives is the single biggest threat to hospital-based infectious diseases in the world right now. And this is largely being driven to infection control during driven by infection control challenges and a lack of effective treatment options. The big three pathogen-wise are Pseudomonas acinetobacter and Enterobacteriaceae. And within the Enterobacteriaceae, we most commonly think about Klebsiella and E. coli, which we'll talk about a little bit more today. And risk factors generally uh, include extensive healthcare exposure, often in the ICU, um, and often um, patients with chronic indwelling devices who receive repeated um, antimicrobials. The more resistant, carbapenem resistance is associated with multi-drug or pan-drug resistance, so it's not just the beta-lactams you lose, there's often many other drug classes that are also lost. We know that CRE and acinetobacter in particular are major infection control challenges and can lead to outbreaks rather, rather ra rapidly. And I think one of the particular challenges with the resistance in gram negatives is while we do have clonal horizontal spread, and so hand hygiene, environmental hygiene is important, certainly within a patient, the emergence of resistance a pre, uh, from uh, susceptible to resistant under the pressure of antimicrobials occurs much more commonly in gram negatives than it does in gram positives. So we sort of have the double whammy of pathogens clonally being spread to other patients, but we also have the emergence of resistance occurring within individual patients. This is a busy slide, and I at least wanted to put on paper the major carbapenemases of interest among Enterobacteriaceae. And the big three classes include KPCs, or Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemases, which are the single most common type of carbapenemase produced in the world, and my understanding is that's the predominant type of carbapenemase here in the Philippines. This is Ambler Class A. It was born and bred in the United States, but has really spread a worldwide. There's the OXA class of carbapenemase, and with the Enterobacteriaceae, OXA 48 is the most common. This was initially um, emerged and spread in Turkey and the Middle East, but now has spread sporadically around the world. And probably one of the biggest threats and most major concerning developments with carbapenemases are the metallobetalactamases. These are the, um, the class for which we have the fewest treatment options that are in the pipeline and currently available. These are extremely efficient hydrolyzers of carbapenems. They do not efficiently hydrolyze estrinum, but <coughs> metallobetalactamase producing organisms often co-produce ESBLs and, and often have resistance to estrinum as well. The emergence of NDM, or the New Delhi metallobetalactamase, has really created a worldwide epidemic, and uh, more traditional MBLs were produced in Pseudomonas um, but the NDMs are much more commonly produced in Klebsiella and E. coli. And this has been really an emerging concern because of lack of treatment options and rapid spread in some locales. Back to some data from the Philippines. This is carbapenem resistance among Klebsiella pneumoniae. And there's a, some important things to note here. About 10% resistance to uh, meropenem among your Klebsiella pneumoniae. But if you look in bloodstream isolates, it's about twice that. It's about 20%. So again, this is not insignificant. This is um, um, relatively high. Certainly, there are other parts of the world where there's much higher rates. But again, for those invasive infections outside of the urine, this seems to be an even bigger problem. Let's switch to my favorite pathogen. And unfortunately, it might be your favorite pathogen or your least favorite pathogen, but the word favorite is somewhere in how you feel about acinetobacter. This is a real sort of monster in terms of antimicrobial resistance. It, carbapenemase production of the OXA class and more, more commonly OXA 23 and 24, 51 and 58 like, as opposed to the 48 in Enterobacteriaceae is common, but also there are other mechanisms of carbapenem resistance, porn mutations, mutations of penicillin binding proteins. And again, acetobacter is, there's often regional 
or their pockets of acinetobacter resistance in the United States. And in many countries like the Philippines and Israel and other places like this, we see fairly high rates. I know Southeast Asia in general has um, uh, seen problems with this organism. Can uh, predilection for ICU patients, and in the U.S. it might be the same here, particularly burn units seem to have big problems with acinetobacter. And while we have limited treatment options for CRE and pseudomonas, we have extremely limited treatment options with acinetobacter valmane, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a few slides. Here, um, this is a busy slide of your acinobacter balmani susceptibility rates. I want you to focus on your sort of the diamond, the dark blue diamond. That's ampsilbactam. We know that sulbactam and carbapenems are the two major treatment options. Your sulbactam resistance nationally has exceeded 50%, which is quite high. And if we look at the carbapenems, um, imipenem is sort of that X, that light blue X, and meropenem is that sort of purple diamond again right around that 50 percent mark. So when you lose sulbactam and the carbapenems, um, you are often in a bind and you're often thinking about things like colistin or polyamyxin B and uh, minocycline and tigacycline to name a few. Just a few words about Pseudomonas aeruginosa, often forgotten about because organisms like acinetobacter or CRE become more popular or more known. But Pseudomonas is sort of the grand old man of nosocomial resistance. It's been around forever and continues to get more resistant and more and more common. Um, it's often multi-drug resistant. Um, it has moved to the outpatient setting, particularly in patients with recurrent UTIs and who receive recurrent antibiotic therapy. And it has multiple mechanisms of carbapenem resistance. Uh, you can see in that top box under beta-lactams, Certainly, carbapenemases, AMPSI hyperproduction uh, contribute to carbapenem resistance, but also horn mutations are very important, and efflux pumps as well. And I was talking to Carl and some of the fellows earlier, Pseudomonas, of these nasty gram-negative, Pseudomonas is the one type of organism where if I have carbapenem resistance but susceptibility to cefepime or piptazo, I generally will trust that finding and will feel comfortable using cefepime or piptazo because usually it's a porn mutation that's knocking out my carbapenems in those instances, but preserves um, uh, susceptibility uh, to the other anti-pseudomonal beta-lactams. Uh, Pseudomonas, just a little bit of a data here. Uh, Ceftazidine is in the light blue X. You have about 15% resistance, and zosin and cefepime generally follow very similar resistance patterns. And your carbapenem resistance is about 15%. So, looks like acetylobacter is by far the biggest problem in terms of MDR and XDR here in the Philippines, followed by CRE, and obviously we shouldn't forget about pseudomonas because it's such a common pathogen. I, today's talk is not focused on infection prevention, but I did want to mention a few thoughts. There's not one answer to control resistant gram negatives. It really takes a multifaceted bundled approach. In addition to obviously hand hygiene, um, uh, environmental hygiene is very important. Acinetobacter particularly can persist for long durations in the environment. Chlorhexidine bathing, while there, the data has not uh, been done as efficiently in gram negatives as it has in gram positives, I do believe there is a role for chlorhexidine bathing in uh, things like ICUs and in patients with indwelling catheters who are at high risk for resistant gram negatives. Screening. Obviously, there's uh, difficulty with screening, but uh, rectal screening for CRE can be quite effective. Active surveillance for CRE and acinetobacter is less effective, but I really want to focus on stewardship, because I think antimicrobial stewardship is particularly important among resistant gram negatives. And I'll, I'll direct you guys to this Lancet ID article by McCall Paul and her group, the first author is Bauer. They did a meta-analysis of antimicrobial stewardship and the impact on resistant pathogens. They looked at 32 different studies, and what they essentially found was that antimicrobial stewardship was particularly effective in reducing uh, multi-drug resistant gram negatives. And if you take a look here at this forest plot, while you may not be able to read that, you probably can read to the right in light green, that there was significant reduction in carbapenem resistance among acetylobacter pseudomonas, pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Klebsiella pneumoniae. 
and generally it's bulk antimicrobial reduction. Some studies have pointed to carbapenem specifically, particularly in Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. For CRE, it seems to be bulk antimicrobials. A couple slides on polymixins before I move to the new agents. They're um, uh, basically, I want to just mention that polymixin B does seem to be a more favorable car, uh, polymixin than colistin. This is because colistin is administered as a prodrug. The prodrug is rapidly renally excreted, and there's a delay in conversion from the inactive prodrug CMS to the active moiety colistin in vivo. And if you give to a patient with normal renal function, they often will excrete the CMS before it can be converted to colistin. So um, uh, traditionally, uh, these have been the cornerstone of treatment for MDR and XDR infections, the big three, the Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, and Acinetobacter balmani. Polymixin B is, has pharmacokinetic, um, um, uh, better characteristics than colistin, and some retrospective data and some uncontrolled prospective data suggest it might be less nephrotoxic as well. Um, there recently were guidelines published. Um, you can see the reference in the bottom right. This will tell you everything polymixin that you ever wanted to know and probably more. Um, <clears throat> combination therapy is recommended um, for, with two, act, two or more active agents. That's active agents, one available for um, the CRE as well as Acinetobacter and Pseudomonas. If you only have the polymixins as an active agent and there's no second active agent, it is recommended to provide agents with the most favorable MICs and CRE and Pseudomonas. This often will be something like meropenem. And the panel was split on Acinetobacter balmane, but uh, due to some recently published clinical trial data, we said if there's no, if there's only no other active agents, that monotherapy is acceptable, but there was a, about, ha oh, it was like a nine to eight vote. Eight people felt that despite some of the clinical trial data that they would still recommend combination therapy, usually with a drug like meropenem. Polymix and resistance is increasing and is concerning. I'm not going to uh, delve into that. And newer agents, in general, are less toxic, and many seem to be more effective, but they're extremely expensive and limited availability. This, these are newly approved therapy in the United States. I know Cephalosy and Tezobactam is available here, although I understand there's a production shortage. Uh, cephalosine tazobactam, it's a, the, the cephalosine is a novel cephalosporin um, that, of that combination. And it's very effective against XDR re, uh, pseudomonas, although we are seeing resistance in Michigan um, and elsewhere. And also it's a very effective ESBL agent. But its real treatment niche in the XDR landscape is the highly resistant pseudomonas aeruginosa. Number two on the list. Ceftazidine, and these are in no particular order, but Ceftazidine may be back then, which I understand is coming. Uh, may not be here yet, but is coming soon. Here, the novel, novel piece of this combination is the beta-lactamase inhibitor, the AV back then, which is a broad spectrum inhibitor of beta-lactamases. Uh, it has indications for complicated intra-abdominal infection, UTI, and pneumonia. It's a very potent inhibitor of ESBLs and also a very potent inhibitor of KPCs, and also of OXA48. So um, while uh, cef um, uh, so ceftazidine may be back dam, really its niche here is for CRE. Meropenem vapor back dam, again, you have vapor back dam as your novel inhibitor, coupled with meropenem. Um, and uh, vapor back dam was designed to really be a specific inhibitor for KPCs. It was designed to target the KPC. So it's regular, relatively narrow as far as carbapenemase inhib inhibition goes. Um, so its real niche is for CRE um, with, that are uh, due to KPC production. And recently improved in the U.S. is imipenem relabactam. Again, imipenem, our old carbapenem friend, um, coupled with relabactam, which is a, um, a bro broader spectrum um, uh, inhibitor than is vapor back dam, but less broad than AV back dam. Um, um, so again, imipenemorella back dam, its major niche are going to be your KPC producing CRE, but due to its inhibition of AMPC, it does actually improve carbapenem susceptibility to pseudomonas as well. And we have seen in the U.S. some cephalosine tazobactam resistant pseudomonas 
that are actually susceptible to septicemia may be backed in. So I can talk about that offline if anyone's interested, but you can think about some unique combination of resistance mechanisms that Pseudomonas might have that might favor one agent over another. These are some retrospective data of ceftazidime, maybe Bactam for CRE. Um, on the left are your uh, ceftazidime, maybe Bactam treated patients. On the right, colistin. You can see that gray area um, essentially means that patients were discharged home alive. So you can see that with ceftazidime, maybe Bactam retrospectively, significantly more patients were sent home. The black area means death, and significantly fewer died treated with septicemia maybe back then. Mirapen and Baber back then all had a randomized controlled study. It was small in XDR uh, gram negatives. Uh, they compared it to best available therapy, which is often polymyxin based, and they essentially had better cure rates than the polymyxins and better safety data, particularly among nep nephrotoxicity. I lost my signal here, and I'm, there we go. Amy Penamarillo back dam, I'm just showing you data with XDR pathogens. This is not published yet, but will be soon. This again was Amy Penamarillo back dam monotherapy compared to colistin plus Amy Penam, and essentially the primary endpoint was overall response. You can see some di differences in definitions with pneumonia, intra-abdominal infection, and UTI. But essentially, the light blue in the figure here was imipenemrella back dam, uh, favorable clinical responses, and throughout the study period, uh, uh, better outcomes in the imipenemrella back dam group and also less nephrotoxicity. Additional and newly approved therapy, ravacycline, which is sort of a souped up tigacycline. It, um, it has even better MICs versus acetobacter than tigacycline. It also is broad spectrum against CRE, including MBL producers. Um, but again, Arava, um, due to some, it actually failed in a UTI study times two. It, so it does not have a UTI indication, but does have a complicated intra-abdominal infection. Due to uh, poor uh, pharmacokinetics in the blood and concerns about serum concentrations, I, would, I don't think Arava is a great option as monotherapy um, for uh, sort of septic patients. Um, with uh, resistant pathogens, but probably would be a good option in intra-abdominal infection, mixed intra-abdominal infection. Plazomycin is a newer amino glycoside, which again, is targeted against CRE, very potent, and um, has an indication for UTI. And finally, the other on this list is cefiterocol, which was recently approved in the US. It's a siderophore cephalosporin, so it takes advantage of iron scavenging by bacteria the sort of uh, Trojan horse approach of getting um, um, uh, the uh, cefidericol into um, uh, the active, the, its sites of action, and it is extremely broad spectrum. It's active against everything that you would ever care about gram negative, including uh, B. cepatia. Uh, plazomycin compared to colistin combination therapy, plazo and combo versus colistin and combo with meropenem. Um, uh, better outcomes in terms of efficacy and less nephrotoxicity. Here's a data that was uh, published um, as a letter in the New England Journal. You can see the survival curve that uh, better outcomes uh, with mortality with uh, uh, plazomycin treated patients. And on the right here, less nephrotoxicity with plazomycin as well. I want to wrap up just talking about cefiterocol because we've been waiting for this drug for quite a while now. Um, there, the, it's approved for UTI. There was a study where it did very well compared to imipenem for treatment of UTI, but this was a credible CR study where it essentially compared against a multitude of carbipenem-resistant organisms, HAPVAP, um, and CUTI and bloodstream infection, compared cefiterocol monotherapy versus best available therapy. And this best available therapy, more than uh, the majority was colistin-based therapy. And bottom line is, it was pretty much non-inferior to colistin-based therapy. You can see cefiterocols in blue and the best alternative therapies in orange. You can see um, uh, against UTI, numerically performed a little bit better, but against HAPVAP, actually a little bit um, um, uh, worse, actually, than colistin-based therapy. Uh, but again, not statistically significant. So truly non-inferior. 
but looking against some of the other studies that were done with these newer agents against carbapenem resistance where they outperformed colistin, this sort of raised a few eyebrows. And if you break this down by uh, pathogen, you can see on the left that Acinetobacter balmane was the more of the problem pathogen for cefidirocol where it underperformed best, alter best available therapy. Um, uh, you can see 43% success versus 53, whereas it performed better um, clinically and in terms of microbiologic eradication with CRE and also did well, equivalent, a little bit better uh, clinically against Pseudomonas. So it will be interesting to see uh, whether FDA puts a black box warning on this drug because it will be approved, but its data in resistant organisms um, is a little bit uh, qu questionable, I think, at this point. So just to wrap up, uh, resistance, this is never a terribly happy talk, because resistance is a major problem. It's only growing in frequency and variety. Infection prevention, I'd love to talk more about that if I had the time, but uh, it's critical and a multifaceted bundle approaches, including antimicrobial stewardship, are extremely important. In terms of polymyxin use, if you're interested, or you're, even if you're not interested, but you have to treat a patient using polymyxins, Everything you would ever need to know is in those guidelines. I'd recommend you to use them. You also are welcome to email me or contact me. Uh, Carl knows how to reach me uh, with any uh, sorts of questions. And I think newer agents are welcomed, but they still have limitations. And unfortunately, I think much of the world is still going to be using polymyxins for the foreseeable future. Uh, Acinobacter baumani, I think, is the biggest continuing unmet need, particularly with some of the um, uh, mixed at best data from a recent uh, credible CR study. MBL producers, we were sort of counting on um, uh, cefidirocol. We do have estreinum com combined with maybe bactam That combination can be effective against MBLs. But also resistance has emerged to every new agent that I've presented in short periods of time. And I think cost is a major issue. Antibiotics are a terrible business model. It's very hard for drug companies to make money on new antimicrobials, and thus they price them quite expensively. And uh, sometimes they're so expensive that you can't really use them. So um, I think these are our ongoing challenges that we're going to have to work together. I'm inspired by your opening ceremony that we need to work together and innovate and collaborate and try to overcome some of these challenges. So again, thank you so much for inviting me. I think I'm up time-wise, but thank you. May we invite the chair, Dr. Mediadora Sanyel, and co-chair, Dr. Carl Evans Hansen, to award our speaker with a certificate of appreciation. May we also call on Dr. Mario Panaligan, president, and Dr. Isa Alejandria to help us to award the certificate. The certificate of appreciation uh, is given to Professor Keith S. K. For, his, for sharing his invaluable insights and inspiring words of wisdom as a plenary speaker, um, thereby greatly contributing to the continuing medical education of this society on the occasion of its 41st PSMID annual convention. Uh, held at the SMX Convention Center, Signed, Dr. Desi Roman, Scientific Committee Chair, Dr. Alejandria, Vice President and Overall Convention Chair, and Dr. Panaligan, President. Let us all give them a round, a warm round of applause. At this point, we would like to officially announce the opening of our exhibits. Check out the pharmaceutical booths, art and research poster exhibits at meeting rooms two to nine. Please be back at 2.30 p.m. for the second plenary session. Thank you. <laughs>